so welcome to the Deal Finders Corner, so your weekly property talk show brought to you by Property Filter, hosted by myself, Guillaume Black, your favorite Frenchman, the CEO and co-founder at Property Filter. So it's the UK's highest rated platform to find deals, as you know, and we are on a mission to empower our property investor and deal sourcer members to find a thousand deals this year alone, thanks to the Property Filter blueprint. The purpose of this Deal Finders Corners is to give you more and the best of the available resources, inviting expert guests who share with you the latest and most current strategies, tactics, and secrets about what actually works right now in terms of finding and making deals and the reality of systemizing and running a high-performance business in property. It really is my pleasure today to introduce you my good friend Simon Ducci on today's Deal Finders Corner and is going to reveal with us the secrets uh, to thriving in today's property market. He will talk us through uh, on, a, on a journey of uh, discovering the opportunities available right now and uh, what works right now actually in today's uh, market. So Simon needs no introduction. Uh, he's an experienced investor, successful entrepreneur and best-selling author. He's widely recognized as one of the top wealth creation strategists in the UK. And a little bit about Simon, if you don't know. Uh, so uh, having started to invest in property back in 1995, uh, he founded uh, the Property Investors Network 20 years ago in, 20, uh, in 2003, which has grown to become the largest property network organization in the UK uh, with monthly pin meetings uh, across 50 cities you know, right now. Since uh, 2003, Simon has taught thousands on how to successfully invest in property to create additional stream of income, uh, give them more time to do the things they, they really want, or indeed build their long-term wealth. I don't think there's uh, Simon's credited enough for the number of millionaires he's made in this country and other countries as well. Uh, since 2007, he launched his Property Mastermind program, uh, which is a 12-month monitoring program, which to this day is the gold standard in the property education space. You might know Simon's book, Property Magic, who became an instant hit uh, when released some 15 years ago now in 20, in 2008 and remains a, a number one Amazon bestseller. So uh, Simon as well launched Crowd Property, you might know some nine years ago in 2014, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform to facilitate uh, lending between private individuals and uh, property professionals. So the stuff we'll cover in today's episode. So First, how to thrive in the current market. So Simon will share what has changed in the last 20 years and how we can capitalize on the current market conditions um, and what are the opportunities uh, to be made right now. So we'll get some valuable insights onto the emerging niches, uh, property strategies, and capitalize on, on, on the market we are, we are in right now. We look at, uh, indeed, the strategies that are you know, tried and tested uh, that, that work in the current market. And I, I believe that Simon's asked me to, he's going to put me on the spot a bit and we're going to look for Simon's next deal uh, on Property Filter. And then we'll have an exclusive uh, Q&A uh, uh, and we'll try to make this session as interactive as possible. And we'll get access uh, indeed to ask Simon, you know, the property mastermind himself, himself, uh, you know, whatever questions we've got for him. So I'm very much looking forward for, uh, for you know, speaking with Simon today and give please give a massive virtual welcome to Mr. Simon Zucci. Here we well, go. Thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. Thanks so much for a very kind response and great to see everyone here. I recognize a few faces and people I don't know as well. So welcome to everybody. And first of all, thank you so much for asking me on to this, uh, this session. It's great to be here. And uh, no matter whether people are new to property or experience, I hope we can share some insights and give you lots of value, make it really worthwhile being here. I'd really encourage everyone to get pen and paper. Whenever I'm in session, I was taking lots of notes and writing things down because I want to give some real practical things you can do uh, to take away with you. And uh, as I said to Guillaume, yeah, let's look for some property deals live uh, just to put him under under the yeah. cost a bit of pressure, which, uh, uh, and actually rather than finding a deal for me, I think it'd be great to find a deal for someone else here, Guillaume. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can we'll, do that, yeah. We'll, we'll do that later on. Who, who'd like to get a, Guillaume to get a deal for them, show of hands? Yeah, if you, if you want to type deals, okay. If you want a few to type people deal. quick, you got to be quick in this yeah. game. Right? If you want to type deal in the chat, there we go. You've got there to move go. quick. We'll come awesome. back to that later. But um, yeah, let, let's start a little bit about the market. And uh, I think we first all need to acknowledge that you know it's a bit of a crazy market right now. Um, what with the the really high interest. Rate. I say that because it's relatively high to maybe the last 10, 12 years. But actually, the interest rates are kind of where they were um, prior to the credit crunch. So as you said, I'm going to look back over the last 20 years and look at how things have changed, because we can learn from the past. We can learn from lessons. And I think what's happening right now feels a lot like 2008, 
2009. Can I see a wave of hands? Who was actually investing back in 2008, 2009? Who was investing that long ago? Okay, just trying to see. Okay, just a couple of people with hands up there. So <clears throat> the, the point I want to make is really important. Listen very carefully. You might have been investing for the last 10 years. You might have been really successful. However, that doesn't mean what you've done for the last 10 years is what you should do moving forward because the market has definitely and is definitely changing. It was a seller's market, particularly the last few years where we had that very unexpected boom during COVID. And I know a lot of people buy into property cycles, and I think there's some, some merit in that. But things like COVID happened, which no one can predict. Things like the government intervention because of COVID happened, you know, bounce back loans, all that money put into the property market. So these things happened, which kind of throw out these cycles. So I think we need to be a little bit careful when looking at cycles, saying, well, every 18 years is going to happen. I don't think that's quite the case. Um, the fundamental trend we need to understand that in the UK, we don't have enough accommodation. So we live on this very popular island with an increasing population and yet a limited amount of accommodation. The UK government are very public about saying we need 300,000 homes every year. And we're making, we're building about 150 to 200,000 maximum. So there is a shortage. However, in every market, and, and property market is a market, markets are cyclical. They go up and they come down. And so what we're seeing right now is a correction. I don't think we're going to see a crash like we had back in 2008, 2009. I mean, I don't know. I might be wrong. But what happened back then, just a quick history lesson for people who, who weren't investing at that time, we had a real boom from 2001 up to 2007. And that was caused because a lot more people became aware of property. The internet became obviously a lot more uh, popular. We had websites like Spare Room, Right Move, Zoopla were created, which, which didn't exist when I first started to invest, um, which is kind of before the internet. We're really showing my age here now. Um, and so it's kind of amazing you think before the internet. It's not a statement you really think about very often, is it? But that's the reality. Um, and so a lot more people uh, became aware of property. We had the introduction of buy-to-let mortgages, and I think in about 1998. So there was this real boom of people coming in and buying additional properties. And also we had something called a self-certification mortgage in the mid-2000s, where basically you could sign to say you could afford something, and they wouldn't actually check your ability to pay the mortgage. Um, and so this is probably what caused the credit crunch, really, because lots of people took out mortgages, which they were never, ever going to be able to pay back. Um, there was lots of irresponsible lending by banks, but also lots of irresponsible borrowing by people who were just signing to say they could afford things. So what happened was all this, uh, these mortgages, which was actually toxic debt that was never going to be paid back, was sold on and sold on and derivatives, et cetera. And so in, in about 2007, in America, they start to realize that the supposed AAA uh, debt bonds they had weren't very good. And that's when the credit crunch started. And it came over here. And, and our first victim in the UK really was Northern Rock. You might remember the pictures back in 2007, November, of people queuing around the branches of Northern Rock trying to take their money out. And it was the first real bank crash we'd seen in modern times, really. Uh, and as you know, the bank, uh, the government had to step in to bail out Lloyd's and all the big banks, et cetera. And a lot of bank banks went down. Interestingly, a lot of property training companies also collapsed because they had been teaching people during the boom period how to buy property. Any, any idiot could buy property when prices going up, but when prices came down, everything changed. And lots of people actually lost their portfolios, lots of money. Uh, it was very difficult to get finances. Banks stopped lending. And some really creative strategies, such as purchase lease options, which are very new to the UK, and vendor finance, these all came into play massively in 2008, 2009. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to learn from the experience when, when most people were shying away from property, oh, property is a really bad thing. There was a small group of people who were educated and recognized, actually, when you have all this uncertainty, there's also a time of massive opportunity. And myself and my clients and other people were buying lots and lots of property 2008, 2009, and have done very, very well from that. 
So I don't think we're going to see the same kind of crash. We're seeing prices come down, and that's partly because of the high interest rates. Affordability is difficult. So we'll talk about that when we come to what might be the good strategies. But the reality is right now, single let properties don't really work. Uh, they just don't stack up for mortgage purposes. Um, and a lot of landlords uh, who have been doing very, very well for years and years are selling up and you always get some people selling up and retiring you get some people coming in new to the industry but for the first time um well, actually it started in 2015 but for the last seven eight years it's been getting worse and worse where we've seen more and more landlords selling up and although new people are still coming in less new people so there's actually less rental stock available uh, which is one of the reasons why rental values have actually shot up and of course because of inflation so whilst many landlords are selling up and getting out the game, and you might be thinking, well, is it, is it really a good time to get in? My view is as long as you know what you're doing, and as long as you're only doing really, really good deals, there's huge opportunity. So what do I mean by good deals? Well, if you're looking to buy property, um, you should be buying at a good, if you're buying normally with mortgage things, you should be buying at a good cash discount. You know, there are Plenty of motivated sellers. In any market, there might only be maybe 5% of people who might sell at a big discount. But I think in a market like this, maybe as much as 10% of sellers really need to sell. Now, many people are still over-optimistic about what their property is worth. So we have to just stand back and wait for those ones. But really, the opportunity is right now, the next 6 to 12 months, uh, as long as you know what you're doing is really good. And so this is why um, I'm a big fan of Property Filter. Um, we actually buy it for all of my students on our mastermind program and all of our coaches. And I tell you, it's been a bit of a game changer. And I know Guillaume's got this goal of a thousand properties. Um, uh, Guillaume, is it is it a thousand properties this year or is it just the next 12 months? Yeah, this year, yeah. This year. And, and, and I don't know if I told you this, but my little sub goal is, I want at least half of those to be my students. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you're um, right. Yeah. Because, because I, I think that, you know, there's opportunity to be had. So guys, what you need to recognize is there are deals out there. Either you do them or someone else is going to do them. And why should someone else do them? You know, and, and it can be a bit scary. Um, you know, think, oh, well, should I buy now or should I wait till the price hits the bottom? Well, I would encourage you, if, if you've read my book, Property, can I see a wave? You've read Property Magic? Wave your hand if you've read Property Magic? Give me a wave. Okay, most of you, I, I encourage you to go and read it again. Okay, and if you haven't read it, go and get it on Amazon or get it on Audible or whatever. And I want to refer you back to the five golden rules. And the five golden rules, I came up in 2007 when I was writing the book and we were just starting to see the market come down. And at that point, back in 2007, I had been personally investing at that time for about 12 years. And I've been teaching other people for about four years. And I noticed there were lots of common mistakes that people were making and, and I had made. And I wanted to come up with some really simple guidelines that could help people avoid those mistakes. And this is the five golden rules. So rule number one is we buy from motivated sellers. And remember, most sellers are not motivated. You want the 5% who are truly motivated. Rule number two, we buy in an area with strong rental demand. And obviously, there's really good rental demand in the UK at the moment, which is good in most areas. But make sure there's lots of people who want to live in the kind of accommodation you have. Rule number two, three, we only ever buy something that makes positive cash flow. So at the end of the month, we take the rent, that's the mortgage, the insurance, the maintenance, the management, because I don't want to manage properties myself. I have other people doing that for me. And I recommend you treat your property the same way. You probably don't want to be a property manager. You can absolutely do a few. That's not a problem, very much part-time. But as you get more and more properties, if you're managing yourself, you have less and less time to actually go and find the deals and do the deals, which is where you make the money. So cover the management as well. But after all those costs, there should be some money left over. And the reality is with interest rates where they are right now, this is why single let properties really don't work. And many landlords have been making very good money from their single let properties, which, by the way, is what the majority of investors do. I mean, if you're in, if you're, if you're, if you know about property filter, you probably know about property network meetings. You probably know about property training. You're probably very aware of strategies such as HMOs and service accommodation, etc. But and you might think that everybody does that, but that is not the case. About 82% of landlords, well over a million landlords, 
they only have single let properties. Okay, so you already have a natural advantage over other people because you have more specialist knowledge than most people. And even, you know, when people think about HMOs, many people say, oh, you mean student properties. And students are one type of tenant in HMOs, absolutely. But there are actually four different types of tenant groups, students being the first. But you'll find sometimes people who, who have had student HMOs, again, they've been very successful in that market, but that's all they know. They don't know about other strategies. And so where they've had oversupply of student accommodation, which by the way, has happened in most university cities because all these new big fancy skyscrapers that have been built in student blocks, um, some of the older HMOs that are a bit further away from the university that have been very easy to rent for many, many years, suddenly they're not very easy to rent. And the landlords go, oh my God, you know, I need to get rid of this. And particularly right now, guys, we're in the summer holiday at the time of filming this summer holiday. Most student property, the accommodation, they signed up January or February for the coming academic year that starts in September. But if there are empty student properties that do not have a contract in place, then those landlords are really worried. And they might be very open to selling their property or doing a rent to rent or a purchase lease option or something like that instead. So if you live in a student area and you can event, identify the properties that are that are still for rent and haven't been taken yet, that's a great tip you might want to write down and take away from this is that some of those landlords might be worried about, are they going to find a new group of tenants? Now, they're only thinking students. However, there are three other types. There are young professionals, people who were students in the past and they've got a job now. And actually, maybe they like living in a student area because lots of great bars, lots of you know people to talk to and meet, etc. cetera. Um, so often students will, uh, young professionals will stay in student areas. You then have just normal working people, people who maybe lived at home with mum and dad, haven't necessarily been to university. Nothing wrong with that. They're just not used to living in a shared house. And actually living in a shared house is far more cost effective than it is living on their own in an apartment or studio, where as well as the rent, they have to pay all the bills. So a lot of people move from home into a shared house. Um, so that's a, a working kind of tenant. And then finally, there are tenants who are on benefits. Now, I don't think it's a good idea for you personally to rent your property to people on benefits. But what many of my students do, I don't do this personally, but many of my students do, they rent to charities who then take care of those students. And you can actually get pretty much the full market rent from the charity because they get a lot more from the local councils, but you don't have to pay bills. You don't have any maintenance or council tax, et cetera. So again, it can be really good. But as I said, most landlords don't know about this, or even if they do, they think students are the only type of HMO tenants. So, um, so great opportunity to pick up student properties right now. And going back to the market, these people who've been making lots of money because they've had low interest rates, they've been hit by this double whammy. So not only have interest rates go up, so that on some properties, people have got single let properties, they're now not making any profit on a monthly basis because of interest rates. Also, they've got this double whammy effect because if they own property in their own name, which most landlords did prior to 2017, and if they've got a mortgage, which again, most landlords have, and if they're a high rate taxpayer, which not all, but some, some landlords are, so they're also hit by section 24. Now you might think that everybody has changed and put something in place to counteract section 24. I was speaking to Mark Alexander of Property 118, um, who uh, they, they have a particular method of helping landlords. And he, 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 his company have helped probably more people incorporate to avoid Section 24 than anyone else. And his estimate is only about 8 to 10% of landlords who could incorporate have actually done it. So don't think that everyone's got rid of this Section 24 problem. It is a big, big problem for many more landlords. So imagine you've got a property that's the, the mortgage has gone up. So actually, it's the same as rent or even more than the rent. So they're not making any cash flow on that property. And yet at the end of the tax year, the tax man is going to come knocking on the door saying, ah, we like the profit from the tax on the profit, please. And well, there is no profit. Well, there is because they now calculate it in a different way. So it's, and I'm sure you've heard lots of this before, but I just want to make sure you're crystal clear to understand why so many landlords are selling up and why that's such a huge opportunity for you. Now, you can't necessarily 
take on a single let and use it uh, in the same way. But if we do HMOs or serviced accommodation, which are more advanced strategies, then what we can do is we can use that property in a much more cash flow positive way. So actually, if we're buying it and getting a mortgage, well, that works for us because we've got such a high cash flow. And even if you're a new investor, you can still get a six bed HMO mortgage on a completely uh, new company with no track record with lenders like Kent Reliance. So even if you're completely new or you've only got single lets, you can absolutely get into HMOs without thinking you have to have HMO experience. So whilst the majority of the market are panicking, sitting back, waiting to see what happens, and lots of amateurs are doing the same thing, if you're educated, if you've got great tools like property filter, you can get in and you can negotiate. Um, I was at our mastermind workshops uh, last weekend. We had one on Friday and one on Saturday. And a lot of our students are using property filter and finding lots of, but I want to give you some tips and hints on this. Um, some of them were saying, property filter is great, but I'm finding too many deals. I'm finding hundreds and hundreds of deals and I, they just get overwhelmed. So I said, look, what you want to do is maybe narrow down your search. Don't have so many little areas and maybe narrow down the criteria. If you've got... If you've got 10 to 20 properties, that's a realistic number. You can, you can look at those, you can do the numbers, you can go and visit the ones where you think there's a good opportunity. And if you're newer to property, there's no substitute for just getting out and actually going to look at properties. You know, you'll, you'll learn so much by looking at properties. You'll see what you like, what you don't like. Getting good at speaking to sellers and building the rapport with the sellers or with the agents is all really valuable stuff. Um, if you want to start sending out letters, which is some of the things that Property Filter are doing now, then maybe you do want 100 properties to come up. Send a letter to all those. And guess what? The calls will start coming in because the whole point about Property Filter and, and you know, Guillaume came to some of my training, our three day accelerator. And on, on that, we used to teach people how how to look on right move and save themselves loads of time and find the properties where probably the sellers might be motivated. Things like where the sales fallen through, what was listed with duplicate agents, or it's on for sale or rent, those kind of things. And Guillaume took that uh, with the team and they created Property Field that does a lot of this work for you. So that's why I absolutely love the software because a lot of the principles behind it are, are kind of what we teach, which is brilliant. And he saves so much time. So by look, using this tool carefully, and in the correct way, you can find great opportunities. So what should you be looking for right now? Well, a couple of things. Uh, I, I do think that off-market opportunities are uh, very interesting because there are lots of landlords who are thinking about selling. If you can reach out to them before they decide to put it on the market, you don't have as much competition. So that's one market. Or let's think about what's on property filter. Properties that are on the market, they might have been on for a while. The sale might have fallen through. Um, we can see things like indicators like dropping the price, great right? indicator they're motivated. And the ones that are motivated, we can reach out to them. The other lesson I want to share with you, one of my masterminds was sharing that he said, well, I'm, I look at what they're on, uh, what they're listed on, and none of the deals are really stacking up in this particular guy's area. And I said, well, you need to be careful. Don't assume that the price it's listed for on Property Filter is the price you're going to pay. You know, a number of our masterminds were sharing that actually they're paying significantly less than it was listed for on Property Filter because the whole point is Property Filter is finding the motivated sellers. So what I would suggest you do is, is do your searches, find some properties, do the numbers to see if they work out. If they don't stack up, Work out what price would stack up based on the rental income that you know you can achieve. Work backwards. Say, okay, well, what price could I afford to pay for this based on getting a mortgage, how much the mortgage would cost, et cetera. And that will give you a level that you can start going in and, and pitching at and negotiating at. And rather than saying to the agent, I'll just put your low offer in, you can actually justify, well, I'm putting this price in because these are my numbers. Here's how it works. OK, and I think you get a lot more credibility doing it that way. Um, the other thing to look for, uh, I believe what happened in 2008, 2009 was a lot of these creative ways of buying property became a lot more popular. Purchase lease options and vendor finance. Now, I find that whenever I speak at events and things or something like this, a lot of investors have heard about purchase lease options. In fact, let me just ask you, let me ask for a raise hands here. People who are on this Zoom, give me, give me a wave if you have heard about purchase lease options. Give me your hands up. 
wave. Okay, that's probably at least half of the group. Okay, put your hands down, please. Now put your hand up if you've actually done, personally done a purchase lease option. Now, isn't that interesting? I don't, I can't see any hands going up. Okay, so I would suggest. We've got uh, Victor. I think Victor is. Uh, oh, Victor. Is okay, okay, yeah. Victor. Okay, so uh, as usually, if you know that people have done our training, right? Um, but this is one of those things that people think they know about but they don't really understand and, and i really encourage you and by the way a slight plug here my next book which is hopefully going to be out end of this month maybe beginning of september is all about options by the way so look out for that because it's a massively misunderstood if you if you really understood it you would be doing some options believe me so for those who don't know an option a purchase lease option is where you find someone who typically they want to sell a property so we can find them on property filter, but they don't need the money. Now, let's be clear here. Most people who are selling a property, they're selling it because they want to access the equity in that property. Okay. That's what most people do. However, some people, they don't need the money. They just don't want the property anymore. So two examples could be a landlord who's retiring. They've got a number of properties, they're selling them up. They don't need the money from the seller. They're probably going to put it in the bank but they just don't want the hassle of the property anymore. Or maybe an inherited property where someone has passed away, they've given the, the property to the kids, the kids don't really need it, no, never cost them, and they're going to sell it, uh, but they don't, they don't need the cash right now. So what we do, we find these people, and typically the people who are struggling to sell for some reason, maybe they're unrealistic about the price they want, or, or maybe it's a bad agent, not doing a good job, whatever it is, they're not selling this property. So we approach them and say, look, we'd like to buy your property. Now, I'm about to tell you something you need to listen to very, very carefully. So please listen very carefully. Most investors will try and negotiate and bring the price down. And there's certainly a time and place for that. And you can absolutely do it in the current market. There's a lot of negotiation to be had. But instead of bringing the price down, listen carefully. We can say to the owner, well, how about if we actually give you the price that you want? We're not going to try and beat you down, but we're going to give you the price you want if you can give me the terms that I want. So what do we mean by that? Well, I'd like to buy your product, but I can't buy it right now. And we can be really honest and look, the mortgage market's a bit of a nightmare right now. It's really difficult to buy properties, but and it takes months and months and months and months. But I'd like to buy your property. But instead of buying it now, I'd like to buy it in a few years time when the mortgage market has quietened down a bit. And in the meantime, I will take away all of the hassle from you. Especially most landlords are self-managing and they just don't want the hassle anymore. Or a, a classic scenario, and I don't want to be sexist here, but property is generally a very male-dominated environment. Now, I'm delighted that on our program, a lot of our successful students are actually uh, ladies. Um, so we're kind of trying to increase the numbers here, but it is typically a very male dominated industry. And um, so you, a scenario you often get is you might have the dad, father in the family, uh, the husband, he's the person who's doing the property, looking after the properties, doing all the stuff, managing the tenants, et cetera, et cetera. Mum looks after the family, she might work or whatever, you know. And sometimes the father, the husband passes away and leaves all the property to the wife and the wife has no interest or no knowledge because the husband took care of her. And I don't want to be sexist. That, that is genuinely a trend that happens very often. So you often get uh, the, the, the widow who suddenly got all this problem. She doesn't want it. She wants to get, she doesn't want the hassle. She doesn't know how to do it. She wants to get rid of it. So that's a classic example. We can come and say, look, we'll buy all the property off you from a number of, over a number of years. We won't try and negotiate on price. But what we'll do, actually, we will um, rent it from you in the meantime. Now, because we're taking all the hassle away, imagine someone sold a property, they'd lose all income from it, right? They sold a property, they lose all income. What we can do is say, well, I'll tell you what, we'll buy it at the price you want in a few years time, and we'll actually still give you some income, not as much as they would make if they were managing themselves, but they don't have that hassle anymore. So we take away that hassle of the management, we give them a little bit of income, we pay their mortgage for them, we take on the responsibility, and particularly if it's a single let, 
as long as you get permission from the lender, by the way, there isn't always a mortgage, 25% of properties are unencumbered, but if there is, we need to get permission. And we can use it as an HMO or as, um, or as a, a, um, an SA. By the way, sometimes we can even pick up properties that are already HMOs, but they're just not being managed very well. So they've already got all the safety things in place. They've already got a license, fantastic. We're just coming in and doing a better job at managing it than the current owner is doing, because maybe they're tired, fed up, they don't know how to do things. They've not moved with the times. Uh, and if we are doing HMOs, by the way, they need to be very high-end HMOs. In most parts of the country, there's an oversupply of very standard HMOs. So you've got to do high-end. Very, very important. Um, if you don't do high-end, you're going to compete with everyone else on price. If you do high-end, you're not competing with price. You could charge much more. And not only do you get higher rent, you get longer rental periods because people are buying into this kind of this co-living environment and they don't want to leave. So high end co-living is definitely the way to go or short term rentals, which obviously also very good cash flow. Be aware, obviously, that the regulation is coming in about short term rentals. We still don't know quite what that's going to look like. But I think that's always going to force a lot of the amateurs out of the market who might be doing rent to SA and maybe there might be requirements to spend money upgrading, improving the safety requirements in the property. And people doing SA probably won't want to do that. The owners probably won't want to do it. So I think a lot of SA will probably close down. So those of us who are still here doing it, it's going to be very good for us. So there's going to be a great, great opportunity for those of us who are in the market, knowing what we're doing, HMOs, SA, don't necessarily have to buy them. We could use things like purchase lease options. And here's another distinction I'll give you before I move on to the next strategy, which is... If we say that we'll give you the today's full price and the market's coming down, we want enough option period, three to five years probably. So the price might come down, but it can recover and hopefully go up. So if we offer today's full market price, that might well be effectively a discounted price in the future when values have gone up. You see, with an option, we agree a certain purchase price we're going to buy it for any time within that period, let's say £200,000 the next five years, and hopefully it's gone up in value over that time. Now, if it hasn't gone up, or if we, we don't want to buy it, we don't have to. We have the option, the right to buy. If we want, we can walk away. But if we do want to buy it and the value's gone up, we can often use that increase in equity as part of the deposit to buy the property. So again, if you don't understand options, you really are missing out big time. You definitely want to pick up on that knowledge. So Guillaume, I think, why don't we actually show people um, what, it might look like to actually find a purchase lease option yep. uh, right now. And yeah, yeah. maybe, sorry, go on. I was thinking there's a couple of questions we can we can look at maybe. Okay, yeah, let's do those first. Uh, so, yeah. so Ken Ken's asking, uh, is this based, do you, can you do lease options on properties which are only mortgage free? I think you touched on that, but maybe. Uh, uh, no, no, you can absolutely do it on. So uh, you could do it on any, here's the thing about lease options. People think lease options is a strategy. It's not a strategy, it's a tool. It's a tool that can work in conjunction with any strategy you're doing. So if you're doing commercial to residential conversions, you're doing HMOs, you're doing SA, you're doing single let, it can work in conjunction with all of those. Okay, it's just instead of buying a property, getting a mortgage and putting a deposit in, you control it with an option instead. That's the first point. As I said, 25% of mortgage uh, properties have no mortgage. That's very, very easy for them. Okay, it's, that's my favorite one but 75% of properties have mortgages. So all you have to do, if it's already an, uh, an HMO and you're, you're gonna use it as an HMO, you don't have to do anything. If it was a single let and you were taking it on and you want to use an HMO, just like if you did rent to rent, you would need to get permission from the lender, consent to let, okay? Um, if it's a residential property, you absolutely need to get what's called consent to let because the owner's supposed to live there, they're not supposed to rent it out. but Look, in this market where people are struggling to sell, lenders are far more open. So, well, like, if you can't sell, I'm okay. We're okay if you rent it out for a few years, then maybe you're going to sell when the market recovers. So, it's just about learning how to do these things and doing them properly. Awesome. And we've got uh, Sarah uh, asking uh, Do you think it is worth the investment to produce an high end HMO? Because you mentioned about, about these on a rent to rent uh, basis. No. So, if you're taking a property on, and it's not your property, or you're doing a rent to rent. So in three to five years, you're going to give it back to the owner. You do not want to be spending a lot of money on that property. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, my rule of thumb, you might want to write this down on any rent to rent deals, 
I think you need to get at least a 100% return on investment. So what that means is, let's say it's going to make you a thousand pounds a month when it's set up, 12,000 in a year, the maximum you could spend on that property to get it up to standard should be 12,000 pounds. You want to get all your money back in the first year. So if you're taking on a property to do rent to rent, if it's a, an HMO, for example, instead of looking for single lets, look for HMOs where there's a tired landlord, retiring landlords, and they have probably not kept it up to scratch. They probably not kept the rent as high as they could. You can go in and, and structurally it's all fine for a very light cosmetic refurb. You know, literally painting everything, maybe cleaning the carpets, maybe some new carpets, maybe some new better furniture, some dressing, maybe a bit better lighting as well. Literally for a few thousand pounds, uh, you can make it look much better and get a much higher rent than the existing landlords was, was getting. So uh, it's a great question. If you don't own it, you don't want to spend a lot of money. However, and here's a really interesting point. With an option, you've got the right to buy this property. So in a way, you're kind of investing in something that you get the benefit of increasing the value by the money you're spending on it. So for that reason, the return on investment we want on an option is only 50% because we've got the right to buy in the future. We don't mind putting a bit more money in. So we get all our money back in two years as an absolute uh, maximum um, because we're going to get benefit of the capital growth as well. So what that means is you might look at a deal that look that doesn't really work as a rent to rent because the money you have to put in, but it would work as a purchase lease option. So just an interesting thing to think about. And Guillaume, shall I share with everyone how they can turn a rent to rent into a purchase lease option? There we go, yeah, it's gonna be quite okay. interesting. So to do rent to rent, you probably, you find a landlord and say, hey, would you be like to get a three to five year guaranteed rental income on your property? And they say, yeah, great. Some do, some don't. <laughs> um, and if they say yes, then all you have to do is ask them an extra question. You want to write this down, guys. So the first question is, would you like to do a three to five year rental guarantee? Yes, I would. Second question is this. And if I like the property, would you be interested in maybe selling it to me in that time period? OK, if I like the property, would you be interested in selling it to me in that time period? And if they say yes, you know, they're open to potentially selling. Now, obviously, you've got to negotiate what we call the heads of terms, the price, the amount of time, how much you pay them, et cetera, over each month. But in essence, they're agreeing to that. So always, always, I suggest, try and get a purchase lease option first. And if they don't want to sell because they want the long-term growth, you can downsell to do a rent-to-rent. -rent. So in my view, PLO and rent-to-rents are very similar, but PLOs are so much more powerful and more flexible. That's right. There's a few other questions, but uh, mindful of time, uh, we can uh, let's go and look for someone. So if someone's looking for a lease option, if you want to type PLO in the chat, and what we'll do is uh, 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 you'll come up. There we go. Ewen was the first again. Uh, and then yeah, let's go. It's the one for Ewen and then one for Sarah. So Ewen, do you want to again. come on mute and, and uh, tell, us, um, tell us more about your area? Hi, guys. Hi, Ewen. Good to see you. So how are you? Where, where, where are you based? Where do you invest? Leicester. Leicester, yeah. Okay. And uh, what sort of cash flow strategy are you looking on the other side? Is it uh, going to be a... I, I, I'd love to find PLOs. Um, I'm trying to get into HMOs. Um, yeah. I, I've seen quite a few. Um, I use Property Filter on an almost daily basis, but um, similar to the, well, what you said at the front there, Simon, there's a million deals and it's, it's uh, spinning plates, isn't it? So... Okay. Yeah. I'll try to help you with that. And it's exactly as Simon says. <laughs> Simon says. Uh, eh, sorry. We've, we've, uh, we've eh, trademarked that, by the way, Guillaume. Uh, I know, I know. You, you, <laughs> I know. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, less is more, you know, like it's it's all about yes. being uh, really niche and clear on about, about what you want and really yeah. hammering down the area with, with this, you know. And the mistake people do is they go too wide of an area, too broad of yeah. a criteria. And then they are back to where they were before Property Filter, where they have this endless list. You know? And the idea here is to is to have a, a short list because most people will have time to do five, 10 viewings a week. And you want to, to do this in, a, you know, in chunks you can manage, you know. And the beauty with Props Filter is just to short list these red hot leads. And so you just go after those five and 10 best ones, you know. And then the next week you do the next, the five, the five and 10, uh, you know, yeah. the next best uh, motivated ones. Cool. So I'm going to share my screen.
And uh, yeah, so Ewan and Simon, feel free to comment as we go. So yeah. the, the way the way this works is you uh, will set up a lead generator in Leicester. So uh, we'll put a, a Leicester uh, postcode, uh, which is not this, sorry, which is LE, LE1. What, what's the specific postcode you and you're looking for? We we look okay. around uh, most of Leicester, you know, like like this. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, okay. I just wanted to demonstrate how the French French a Frenchman can know uh, postcode geography as good as anybody else, but uh, I failed, you know, miserably. <laughs> uh, so you might want to go look around Leicester or like little towns that works for you and agglomerate the postcodes that uh, that are good. Uh, LE three, LE nineteen, uh, Guillaume, really. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, that the more niche you are, the less potential leads you'll get. Um, but I think it's good to start, uh, sorry. Me, and then if you're not getting enough, you can always expand the area, can't you? So you said you are you are on, on which one? Sorry, LE19. LE yeah, LE19 uh, and LE3. And okay. you, is, that, is that because you think those are particularly good areas for HMOs? Yeah, predominantly. So um, oh, sorry, I already got to. I've done your learning before, Simon, and you, I know you, you have. Yeah, I recognise you. Yeah, thank you. You, you talk about not just um, uh, students, but 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 others as well. So there's. Yeah. Um, um, a nursing university, uh, Leicester Royal Infirmary, um, other employers, other hospitals, whatever. There you so go. It's, it's there's good transport links. There's all kinds of things. Uh, awesome. so a lot of that area is, is Article Four, but you know it's still the, the the hot area to be. Yeah, awesome. So that's great. So what I've done is I I've came down to just the, the south of Leicester. Is that okay? Thank you. Got nineteen and three, and I've uh, I've sort of chucked these in as a bonus. Uh, and then here, the way this would work is you can choose some of the, those filter templates and you can, there's two main ways you can find those lease options. And one is those properties that are for sale as well as to rent. And then if you want, we can put more criteria in there, but just for the purpose of this, uh, let's set these up. We'll call this lease option for sale and to rent. I see, so we've got these set up in, in, in seconds. And then where do we start? So what this does is, is match and merge, you know, Anything that comes from all, all the portals, you know, like it's the equivalent of having right move to play on the market, prime location, and quite a few others all in one place. But where do we start? We know that all of these are for sale as well as to rent. Uh, and 26 is a good is a good number you could go after in a, in a, in a matter of weeks. But what, what should you focus on this week alone? And it's where we've got this motivated seller banner on the top on the top left. And if you only do one thing this week, is look at these properties that are for sale uh, as well as to rent, but also where the price has been reduced and it uh, it uh, came, you know the sale fell through, came back on the market. These are the ones with the biggest signs of motivation, and you've got quite big quite big properties as well. Uh, I, you can exclude here, you know, this includes a an option an auction at a very attractive uh, you know bidding starting bidding price. Uh, we can exclude these from the filters if you want. You can put a, a maximum price on things as well. Uh, but that's that's sort of how, how it would look like. So we've got something here where uh, they've had it for six eighty five back in September last year. They've dropped it all the way to five uh, five hundred. It doesn't seem like they've had a sell fall through. But what what seems to happen here? Uh, so you know the blue line is the price history. The background is the availability status. I mean when we've got a small strip like this, it's often when the agents refresh the listing when they take it off, take it off and put it back. Uh, but we, you've got all the all the history here. The beauty with this one is that uh, it's really it's really large, you know, it's 250 uh, square meter. So there might be some scope for uh, for doing some different exits, different developments. Uh, and uh, you can see here uh, the price per square meter on this property is 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 um, yeah, so it's pretty close to the uh, actually pretty close to the average. I would expect on a large property, they're usually uh, smaller. And what you see is that. Uh, uh, it's a large property, therefore it's expensive, but you can see here comparables of a four bed properties go for a lot less. Um, and they add this, uh, they, they've had this for two, this is an existing HMO it seems, and these are uh, a room, the, the last room that they have let, and you can see the history of uh, of these here. So this is, this seems to be an existing HMO that is for sale with an history of it being uh, to let as well, and the last room let just recently. So and this, this is a great example, game of, of, you know, sometimes um, landlords are massively unrealistic about how much their property is worth. Yeah. Look, they've had a big drop here. So that, that would suggest they, they might have tried to value it on a commercial basis. That's and right. A big tip here, never, ever, ever buy an HMO on a commercial valuation. You want to be buying on bricks and mortar valuation. 
if you're selling it, yeah, you want to sell on commercial if you can, but you never want to buy on a commercial valuation. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this seems quite nice as a property. Uh, like it's when I mean nine, nice is that there is scope to improve, you know. Yeah, uh, and probably very realistic with uh, with prices. What I would say is you've got a link here to a company's house as well. So uh, you know that these, these the, the owner here, you can just go and uh, connect with them directly. You know, account overdue, you know, that tells that tells a lot. So you can write directly to them. There's quite a few things you can do. And yeah, we've- Just interrupt, I've actually been to see this property. I've spoken to the owner. I've been around it twice. There we it's go. A fabulous property, but uh, underneath all the, all the stuff you're seeing, and, and I'm so- grateful that you, you've, you've gone into exactly that property for me because i've, I've chased it for a while but yep. there are a number of issues with this one and I, i'm so glad you're looking at it but um the the account server due thing the link to company's house yeah um, for those reasons i had to walk away but i'm so so glad you picked up on this one i see you know like this is one you know like with brilliant. with uh, lease options uh what i've seen people do really really well is they they anchor a low cash offer and say this is what i can offer you right now or you can take this thing where, you know, as Simon says, you know, uh, about uh, your money, you know, your price, my terms. And then they've got the two options here. It's why on most, uh, on most websites, when you buy products, you've got this, uh, not property filter yet, but uh, this uh, silver platinum gold thing. And it's just here to anchor, anchor things. So you can use, you can, you can position, you know, your, pro your lease option very well in contrast with a low cash offer there. And I, I don't know what the issues are with with this, but uh, if you've already been there, you know you you th there is going to be someone who makes a deal with this at some point, and with yeah. the time you've already invested, you know the deals are in the follow up. I would say you probably want to go and, and see yeah. like whatever number works for you and whatever problem it, it it has. If you can factor or you can solve this problem, you know it would work on the uh, on the other end. Kim, can I just ask Evan some questions around this because it might help everyone? So on this particular property, Evan, what, what's the problem the seller's got? Just briefly, if you can summarize it. Uh, blimey, briefly. Um, <laughs> I think without being too brief, he's got three properties for sale. All are owned by the same um, uh, company. Um, he's based down in Hertfordshire. And I think initially he put um, prices on the properties that were sort of Hertfordshire type prices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think each one of them has come down by a hundred or two hundred thousand pounds each. Yeah. yeah. Um, Guillaume uh, noticed in company's house records there that the accounts haven't been submitted for I think since two thousand seventeen. I think when I while I remember it, look at oh, it. Wow. Um, I spoke to the owner. I made an offer, um, and I, I won't go into that. It's not fair or professional of me to do so. But what I did for his benefit as well as mine, um, uh, and basically said, you know, we are doing this. You know, I know it looks contrary to that, but we are doing this. And the more research I did, I realised he wasn't. Going to some of the basics, um, the interlinked fire alarm, sorry, the, the fire fire management is not interlinked. The fire doors are not fire doors. The fire yeah. escapes are not adequate. Um, on all of the HMOs, the licenses were all out of date as of last July and August. Um, when you look at um, being a, how do we put it, a correct and proper person, you have to apply, yeah, yeah. approve that first of all, go here yeah. and the license. Um, they weren't, I don't think able to honestly say that they were, so would struggle to uh, apply for a license again. So a number of things. Yeah. But you're right. The, the property is absolutely beautiful. The potential is amazing. You know. Um, I, oh, I did so just sorry to interrupt. I'm just conscious of time, and I know we've got to do another example as well. But just everyone listen to this very carefully. This is a classic scenario. And Guillaume's actually right. someone is going to do a deal here on this property at some point. It's just a question of who and when and how much. Because um, it looks like the property is great but it's the owner has got the problem yep. yeah, and they've got this real challenge and it's about making them feel the pain that they have and showing them how you can give them the solution. You can give them the medicine and that's the skill is knowing what to say. And as also as Kiam said, it's all about the follow-up. What happens all too often, people look at it, it looks really great. They make a low offer or they try and do an option, it gets refused. Think, oh, that's, that's not going to work. They go on to the next one. And what you must do with property filter, property filter design like this, you, you put it in the follow-up box and you keep on going back and you've got to build that relationship. That's where you're going to do great. And this may or may not be a deal that even you do, but someone's going to do a deal on this property at some point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think you should follow up with it. And especially if you've got three properties, we've got three times the problem and they just, they just compound, et cetera. So there'll come a point where they'll have to make a deal of some sort, you know, so... Yeah. 
And, uh, and when... that, that problem with the license, you know, um, so here's just another really important lesson for everyone, particularly on HMOs. There are lots of landlords who are selling properties and, and the licensing changed in uh, October 2018, right? So someone might have a property that right now, although this license is lapsed, right now they could have a fully current up-to-date license that was issued before October 2018 because they last five years generally. But when it comes to relicense it, they won't get approval for as many rooms because one of the things that came in in 2018 was the minimum room sizes. Now this varies from council to council. The national standard is 6.51 uh, square meters in a single room and 10.2 for a double room. But the whole point is when you're buying an HMO, particularly if it's an existing licensed one, it's critically important that you check the room sizes and make sure they are big enough to comply with the local council standards. Because when you buy it or when the current license runs out, uh, if you're doing an option, you will need to renew the license. And you want to make sure you can absolutely do that. So that might be one of the challenges that this guy's mm -hmm. got as well. Yeah, and it's a very large property. It's got lots of potential. So if you follow up with it, I wouldn't be surprised. It might take you 18 months, but you might bag it at 300,000 in 18 months. You know, like this is yeah. quite, this is what the follow-up does, you know. And I then, think I think with the problem he's got though, because he's actually operating illegally at the moment. With yeah, no yeah, license, yeah. And there's a huge fine for that. So uh, done in the correct way with the right rapport, you can really make him understand the problem he's in and, and just take the problem away. And then you, you being a decent proper person can get the license as an, as a, uh, a manager rather than the owner that's what yeah. you do when you have an option yeah. um and and this could be a great solution evan so you know well done for finding this and as scheme says you definitely want to follow up on it yeah so and then similar story so next property seems like it's an exist existing hmo as well oh is it the same guys so we've got all this portfolio here you know so yeah you see they're all they're all here okay great thanks a lot so let's move to Where the uh, deals are Guillaume. what's that it's where the deals are. Yeah, yeah. Props filter. Props filter. It's where the deals are. Indeed, yeah. yeah. And then we've got the old portfolio all in a all, all in a row here, which is quite uh, quite interesting. Fantastic. Uh, Should we look at see was it one of the others on yeah, there? Yeah, we had the uh, Sarah Coop, uh, I believe. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, I'm looking for the same thing. So. There we go. So let's see what we another way we can look at this in the same in the same area. So I won't take the same area, but we can I can duplicate this area here. Uh, we can look a bit further mm -hmm. afield as well uh, on some other parts of Leicester. And then we can look at other things where we look for uh, properties for sale. Uh, we can exclude the flats maybe. Uh, and these, uh, these things here, we can exclude auctions. And we look for properties for sale for less than what they last sold. What we call here, uh, you know, in the difference from last sold price, uh, the, the potential negative equity. <laughs> so there will be a lot of flats actually. Uh, in this current market where you can especially if they, are, if they work for like uh, service accommodation they'll be great uh, but let's see what comes up here as i suspected there'll be less houses uh, but uh, still quite a few and these are all houses for sale for uh, for slightly less than what they last sold and again it's the same thing where where do we start we start for, with these where the sales fallen through uh, and was reduced and so we've got something here which is with two different agents. So it's right now with these guys, uh, Nest, uh, since, sorry, since October last year. And since the 1st of January, they've been with this, uh, this uh, Spencer guys here. And what it seems like is that they, they've now dropped the price all the way down to what they last bought. And they actually only bought it a, a year ago, which seems crazy, but they've only bought it a year ago and they, and they, they are looking at selling already. And they, it seems like they are struggling to, to match the price they, they got previously. Uh, so that might be uh, something. Let's see the next one. So this was again, so, so it's a similar one where it's a bit yeah, crazy. So people bought properties last year and they are trying to get rid uh, just now. So yeah, interesting story. Let's see about the, what do we have the next ones? We've got something a bit, uh, obviously, let's look at this one here. So this is, this is, this is, this is, uh, Wow. So somehow they, they, they spent 450 on this and they are now trying to get 315. So it's a bit of, of an out of town uh, sort of area. But this is where we will we'll look at pitching uh, lease options. Let me see if I add the flats for this example to see if we've got a bit more uh, things where we can work on actually. Let's see. 
I'll just add some flats. I will put a maximum uh, maximum price, I don't know, 50 maybe, just to get, uh, not to get too many results. Here we go. Uh, and let's see where we got here. So we've got something here. So this is for sale 15% less than what they last uh, sold. Uh, for sale with an history to rent. So they have bought the property in 2005 for 200,000 and they are now struggling to sell since uh, 15 months. Uh, it's now 170. Uh, so they had two sales fall through and uh, yeah, two sales fall through a reduction and they are struggling to sell. So when we've got things like that, and they are struggling to sell at a loss, it tells us two things. One is they don't need their own money right now because if they really needed to, they would have crystallized their losses and stuck it into an auction and get some certainty to get their money in 28 or 56 days. And uh, and and two, they, are, they genuinely are in some form of pain because the capital they put into, they, they are not going to see back. So what we've seen people do quite well with these, and, and sadly, it's when people bought... You know, new build properties in the in the the last boom. You know, on the uh, you know two thousand you know two thousand five two thousand seven, uh, the the market's not picked up with the the value, and if they have a mortgage, so there's different ways to approach this. But if they have a mortgage or not, you can that works. But if they have a mortgage, it's likely the the balance on the mortgage on this. You know, if they bought it for two hundred thousand, let's say they they put a uh, they put uh, at the time they could have had uh, 80, 85 percent loan to value. If it's still interest only, they might they might have uh, you know 100 and 160, 170 uh, mortgage balance on this. You know, you only know once you start you know speaking with them. But this is where you can reframe the whole idea of the asking price, which is a big six figure number, down to the the, the four figures they will actually uh, access. You know, once they've sold the property access their uh, the equity and uh, and pay all their fees and, and and things like that so what we've seen a few people do quite well with these is uh, is say oh is position and say oh look you know uh, once you've paid back your mortgage once you've paid the agent and once you've paid all these things uh, what you're looking at is actually uh, you're trying to sell this house to access four or five grand uh, and what what if we give you uh, you know this equity in form of the option contribution right now uh, and then we just take the take take away the asshole, you know, and then or we agree on something on three to five years, etc. And um, and then they get what they wanted right now. And it's a very uh, it's a much easier pitch because if somehow you don't perform, you know, some of the objections you you get with these things is oh, what happens if you don't buy? And so well, you've already got the money you wanted for it, you know. So you you'll, you'll get to sell it again, you know, in five years. I know this doesn't sound like something you want the asshole with, but uh, the worst case is you get paid twice, you know. So, so that's uh, that's kind of the stuff that works well. More, there's a lot more of these with uh, flats, and and if, especially anything that that's been built uh, in the notice. And by the way, you can create filters on property filter that target anything bought between let's say 2003 and 2008, and you can look at all those properties. And a lot of these will have histories like that. Uh, and then if they don't have a mortgage, it's it's uh, it's easier because the mortgage is not is not here, but obviously they would have if they needed the money right now they would have sold so that's kind of the two main ways and and then i would say you want to offer a lease option on every offer you make so you've got the the low cash offer that works for you right now or you know like a my price your term or your term my price uh one next to each other and we've seen people do really well so i've had the a testimonial uh sent to us just yesterday uh by someone who did just that so House was on the market for so none none of none of the issues here just uh, just been back on the market and reduced the sale fell through a couple of times and they reduced the price twice and he offered like this so I get you a lease option for two hundred and forty and we we cover the mortgage and a few things for the next uh, four or five years or a cash offer one seventy and we took the one seventy you know just so you never know uh, you you never know you know sometimes so it's always a good tool uh, because either way it works for you you know. That sort of Would you expect them that so let's just say you know it was a five thousand um, pound payment. Would you then deduct that off the end point? Yeah, so you, it's a good question. So I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll pass this to uh, down to, yeah, to sign so up again. I, you can you can agree option, everything. It, it, it's all negotiable, but generally, if you if you put down an upfront option fee, and what that means in this case, let's say it's five thousand pounds to give them the equity that's remaining in the property. It's a lot less than you'd put in as a deposit, so it's still good for you. 
And um, if you buy the property, that initial option fee comes off the end price. However, if you walk away and don't exercise the option, which is your right to do, you lose any initial fee. So you have to be very clear what you're putting down. And, yeah. you know, the good thing about an option, you don't need to exercise if you don't want to. But my belief is you should have the intention at the beginning, if you're yeah. going into an option, that you do intend to exercise it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Awesome, cool. Uh, so there's quite a few questions. So what I suggest is uh, uh, we're going to wrap up and what we're going to do is I'm going to pass the questions to Simon. And Simon, do you mind recording a little uh, Q&A on your own? And we'll yeah, I can definitely Facebook do group. that for you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's do that, that's perfect. So yeah, thanks a lot, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, Simon. I, so I think it's a great, great reminder for everybody. So the, the five golden rules of, of property investing. So as you said, we've ingrained this into property filter. So rule number one, always buy from motivated sellers. It's how, you know, the old principles behind property filter has been, has been built. Uh, but yeah, buy to let properties don't work right now. 82% of landlords still hold buy to let properties and they've got their mortgage uh, uh, running out. I think that was really interesting. Uh, the landlords right now that, that missed on the student market will be motivated because they'll sit on empty houses from September. So these are really good deals to, to look at. Simon mentioned about uh, Mark Alexander and uh, and the people at Property 118. Uh, Mark actually spoke a few weeks ago here. So if you want to go and look at the, the recording of how they do their uh, the things with tax, and I think they offer a really good uh, service for uh, for you guys if you want to refer them uh, as part of your sourcing uh, offering. Um, yeah, that was really, really interesting. And then observe the masses and do the opposite, Simon. So that was, uh, again, this is ingrained into uh, property filter and your advice on how to use property filter, you know, less is more, go, you know, like go on a niche area because we built a bad, bad habit. You know, we used to be on right move, 50 mile radius, you know, and <laughs> sold by price and then, you know, show me the 5,000 properties. So yeah, just, it's why we built it by postcode. So you can really, you know, like go straight to the, the niche, you know, that works uh, with you. And then indeed, you can use property filter for your own market or direct to vendor. So a lot of the good deals we see people do is they just because we find the full address, you know, you just you just send the letters to these guys and then you get you get a conversation started with them. Or if you are cheeky like me, you leave a little note at the viewing or, or you forget your notebook at the viewing and you need to come back uh, so that these are this always works uh, really well. And, uh, and yes, nothing stacks, you know, if you look at the asking price, nothing stacks, you know, so there's a very different world between what the, the agent had, had pitched to the, uh, the vendor and the asking price compared to what you're actually going to sell, you know, on the other side. So never look at the asking, asking price, offer what works for you and just never miss a, a follow up. So, and then as Simon says, this is uh, like the, the season's open to, uh, to the lease option, you know, and uh, we've seen a few examples here. And I think this is going to be a really big and I know Simon, so you've got your book coming out, and quite a few, uh, quite a few um, uh, resources people can access for lease options. Yeah, definitely. I'll mention it. So uh, the book's going to come out, come out uh, and, and I'm sure Point of View will, will email everyone about that. You might want to have a look at that. We'll, we'll we want to make another Amazon bestseller, as my first book has been many times. So uh, look out for that. Um, that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, I think Guillaume, I think you're coming to our Property Magic Live event uh, in September, which is uh, we have right. all our cool. masterminders and it's a great event. So I'll give you the dates. Uh, I'm not going to link for it or anything today, but just so you've got the dates in your mind is 8th, 9th and 10th of September. And we're going to be talking about really what is the best strategy to be using in the market right now and how to do it. And, and options is going to be a big part of that training. So that's 8th, 9th, 10th September. It's a hybrid event. So you can join us virtually or you can physically come and join us in the room uh, in Heathrow, which is going to be awesome. And the final thing is, Guillaume, um, we've got some training that I'm doing next Monday. And if, if anything I've said today has been has resonated, think, oh, that makes sense. That's good. Um, I'm going to share some of what we call our success accelerators, some of the things that our really successful masterminders do to achieve amazing life-changing results in such a short amount of time. So you've got a free webinar we're doing next Monday, Monday night, and I'm just sharing the link in the chat box if that's okay. If you click on the link in the chat box, you can go and register. It's complete free training. It's 90 minutes. And we Simon, just, to, just on this, so are you saying that you've taken all the success stories that of people on your mastermind and you've condensed this into like a bit of a session to share what people are doing right now that works? Yeah, it's not not just success stories. It, it's the it's better than that. Uh, we will do some case but it's actually it's the principles that a lot of the truly successful people have actually applied and that have worked and uh, and how they've got game changing results. And some of it are things common sense you'll know, but some things you would never have thought about 
And we're sharing all of that probably for the first time ever on Monday. So guys, come and register for that training. Yeah, I'll come and have a look here. I'll probably see you guys there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so please, please take a, please uh, open the link, take a copy of it, uh, and uh, yeah, save it on your browser. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Are you opening this to other people, or is it um, uh, just? I know, we, we, no, we are going to do it to our, our wider database. It, it's not just property filter, I'm afraid. But um, okay, so we are the first two in, in the. But you were the first, well, I've not even told my own database about this. You were the very okay. first people to know about it. Yeah. Okay, and I, I guess it's just online. Ninety minutes. So it's it's more... online. It's going to be. I think it's Monday evening. Uh, that's the seventh of August, I think. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Till yeah, you, nine thirty. Yeah. So, see me by the way, bring a notepad and paper. You're going to want to take lots of notes. There's lots of practical actionable things as we've shared today so we've got value for today you're going to love next monday okay and it's free you know so it's awesome absolutely know? and okay. i will be talking more about our property magic live event on that training so ah, yeah so by the way i did the uh, 2018 2019 i did attend simon's uh, property magic live which were really a game changer for me you know because sometimes you have to rewire your brain and it's being in a room with uh, people who are on the same journey and then uh, you, you have to face some uh, you know uncomfortable truth you know about your belief and i think uh, the, uh, things shifted for me at this event so i really recommend you look, looking into the property magic live which are yeah in september there's there's a lot of mindset stuff we're going to do and and in particular what we're trying to do is really get people to really go big or go home the next 12 there months there's so much opportunity and and you know dm i'm not sure if you invested by 2008 but there were, there were lots of people who sat back didn't do anything for literally a couple of years very active before the credit crunch they did nothing for years and years I come 2015, they kind of look back and thought, what, how, how did I miss that opportunity? And it's going to be the same. This next 12, maybe to 18 months, 23 and into maybe 24, um, it's going to be a, a golden opportunity to pick up some incredible deals. And then we're going to some people who, who are kind of on webinars like this and they're hearing about it, but someone's getting in the way and stopping them. They're not going to do it. And then five years later, they're going to look back and kick themselves with pain and regret, thinking, why on earth did I miss that? So do not make that mistake, guys. We're going to help you really see the wood for the trees, work out a really clear plan, a really big plan, give you the confidence belief to go for it. It's going to be an amazing event. It's going to be a game changer. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for offering this to us, so Simon. Uh, do, do you have any uh, last uh, last thoughts, Simon? Uh, I just just thank you for uh, inviting me on. I hope people, guys, you got some value. Things, just type in value into the chat box. I yeah, hope you I got definitely got some value, value. Uh, from this training. And uh, I just want to thank you again because you know you've done such a great job with Property Filter. Uh, it's making my job easier for my students. Uh, now there's no excuse for not finding deals. Um, obviously, you need to know what to say to sellers and how to negotiate. That's a whole new set of skills. But actually finding the deals. There's no excuse for not finding deals. Uh, as I said earlier, my one point, my, my one tip is that sometimes people find too many deals, get overwhelmed, so just niche it down a little bit, um, be a bit more focused, uh, less is more. In fact, that's one of the things we're gonna talk about Property Magic Live. Um, one of our guest speakers is a guy called Dr. Benjamin Hardy. You might oh. have heard of Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Uh, it's a very good friend of mine. He's an international best-selling author of things like Who Not How, uh, personality isn't permanent, permanent, willpower doesn't work, um, your future self now. And his latest book is called 10X is Easier Than 2X. And the principle behind it is what most people do, they do more and more and more. They look for more deals, they speak to more sellers, they try and step up their activity to get more deals. And you will get more results the more action you take, but you'll only ever go 2X. Actually, the key is doing less, but being more focused and executing better to go 10X. And that's what Ben's going to be talking about at Property Magic Live and the whole event's all about. Yeah, so it's going to be really awesome. Yeah, it's really awesome. So, so to put this in context, so I, I think I think he came for his first ever UK gig to speak at Property Magic Live in He did, yeah. He, he, in fact, it wasn't his first UK gig. It was his first ever. I think you were there, weren't you? That yeah, one? yeah, yeah. So, so, his... so when I said this was a game changer for me, like I specifically uh, like, like remember like uh, Benjamin Hardy's talk. And so... Yeah. Like if, if this is a big deal, you know, like, so it was, uh, I'll come back to see him. Like definitely. It was, it was his, I, I met him. I, I, you know, I'm always investing in myself. I'm in a mastermind group in America. It's not a, not a property group, but it's a, a business group. And uh, I, I was at one event. I literally, I, there are 60 people in the room. I have three events a year we go to. I was sat down as one event. This young guy was sitting next to me and started chatting. It was Benjamin before he bought his yeah. first 
And we just really clicked. And he said he'd bring this book out. I said, hey, how would you like to come and speak? So I flew him over to the UK for his first ever speaking gig. Uh Uh, And uh, he just smashed it. He was amazing. And I thought, bloody hell, he's I thought he is going to be just incredible. And he is. I mean, I think his books get better and better. Uh, And here's this is a big thing, guys. He does not do many live events. He does he does lots of videos, but he doesn't do many live things. And I'm pulling a real favor to get him to come and do this uh, interview. And everyone who comes to Property Magic, before they come to it, we, we're buying and sending them a copy of his book, um, wow. 10X Season 2X, so they can read it and really get the most out of it. But it's going to be amazing. It really is. So, I'm going to be cheeky here, Simon. Uh, um, I think because... I think I got the recordings of uh, Benjamin's talk on on a private YouTube link. Is yep. it uh, from Property Magic Line 2018? I, I've got it saved somewhere. So if it's okay, can yes. I share this with the Property Filter community? I will. I will let you share it with the property. Yeah, as long as long as you say on there that obviously you know Ben is is speaking of Property Magic Live. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's fine. Like, it was this talk was a game changer for me, and I'm really happy that he's coming back to UK for your event. You know, so yeah. and it, it will be it will be different talk. It's his latest talk, all about 10x. But, yeah, this was five years and, ago. And like, just to so. be clear, he, he is doing this one via Zoom. He's not going to be there live, but oh. it's a live conversation I'm going to have with him and okay, awesome. you you will have the opportunity to ask him questions uh because we'll have a, a Q&A session yeah well. that's well worth it yeah well, I'm quite excited about this Simon actually I didn't know so yeah oh well there thought. you go <laughs> and we have All some right. other surprises we're not announcing yet but there's some stuff that's going to just blow people away this this is going to be I'm getting excited about this this is going to be our best ever property event I think and and you want it's like one of those things you want to you want to say you were there not that you missed it and just heard about yeah, it yeah yeah, yeah, that's well, also true. Well, thanks so much, Simon. Thank you for joining us today, everybody, in the today's Deal Finders Corner. So register to Simon's webinar, see uh, what uh, are the hidden strategies, you know, uh, that Simon is going to uh, share with you next Monday. And uh, visit propertyfilter.co.uk, log on to your Property Filter account, check out your deal blueprint, define your goldmine area, engage with motivated sellers, asset properties, assess properties in seconds, load your pipeline and make deals, have an endless supply of deals, join the top 1% and become a high achiever deal finder. I hope you enjoyed today's deal finder corner. I'm really looking forward to speak to you next time. Thank you very much. Have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you so much, much, Simon. Thank you, everybody.